Well, good morning, Clark Atlanta University. Our choir is preparing themselves. They're on, they're coming out as we stand. We are delighted to have you join us for our 37th annual C. Eric Lincoln Lectureship Series. New president, Dr. George C. French, <laughs> our provost, Madam Dorcas Bowles. She's in the audience. Can we give her a hand for being here? <laughs> our dean, Dr. Jamil Teller, our faculty, our staff, and of course to our students. This lectureship is the preeminent lectureship series in our country, honoring a black scholar in religion. For 37 years, we have hosted this lectureship. Dr. Lincoln was a tremendous scholar. His contributions to religion and sociology in America, none parallel his scholarship and his love for African people. So we thank God for the griot his wife is here. We have a lot of special guests here, students, alums. But Mrs. Lucille Lincoln, the first lady of the lectureship. Can we give her a clock Atlanta welcome? <laughs> and also to our first chair, the chair of the first department here at Clark Atlanta University, the first chair, Dr. Henry. Welcher, my spiritual father. Can we give him a clock around of welcome? Just a few housekeeping things. Uh, we are taping, live streaming and taping for CAU TV. So we want you to take a minute and please silence all electronic devices. Please silence all electronic devices. We're so grateful for your presence. The students are still coming in. Please let them come in and get seated. We're going to ask that you please remain seated until the blessing of the benediction. I promise we'll be out by 2.30. <laughs> I used to get a laugh on that one. <laughs> but we're going to uh, proceed with our program. We're honored to have what I believe is the greatest collegiate choir in the nation the CAU Philharmonic Society. They're gonna bless us with our choral invocation and then our black national anthem. And then we're gonna have greetings by Dr. Rico Chapman, our assistant dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, Department of Humanities. Then one of our student majors, Taylor Lancaster will come and introduce our speaker. And then our choir will bless us again and we'll hear from our lecturer. Let's bow our heads and receive our choral invocation.
Take my hand, take my hand, Lord, and lead me
another round of applause to the CAU Philharmonic Society and Dr. Curtis Powell. I think we need to, I know we need to have a moment of silence for Reverend Dr. Kane Hope Felder, one of our preeminent and comparable theologians of our time who just passed away last yesterday at the age of 76. Thank you. I bring you greetings on behalf of Dr. Daniil Taylor, Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences. My colleague is here, Dr. Jadeep Chaudhry, Associate Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences. I want to thank Dr. Philip Dunstan, Chair of the Department of Religion and Philosophy, and his team for spearheading once again, <clears throat> excuse me, the C. Eric Lincoln Public Lecture here at CAU. The theme is fitting, a mind is a terrible thing to waste, on being black, Christian, and an intellectual. Since we know that in the School of Arts and Sciences that whatever career path you choose, it is important that you be a thinker in your, <clears throat> in your area. Uh, Reverend Joshua Lazard is doing just that, becoming a leader and a thinker, an intellectual around the topic of Christianity and black youth. We're honored to have him back. I am positive that you will today be filled with new ideas. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, tear it up from uh, the moment of silence. And uh, fresh perspectives. Uh, thank you again, and uh, greetings. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I have the preeminent pleasure of introducing our lecturer today um, by the name of Reverend Joshua Lawrence Lazar, which is a Chicago Southside native. Joshua is a graduate of Fisk University with a BS in accounting after attending Dillard University in New Orleans. He went on to graduate from the Johnson C. Smith Seminary after attending ITC with a Master of Divinity and a Master of Arts in Church Music with a thesis entitled, The Effectiveness of Music and the Role of Preaching in the Black Church. While in seminary, he discovered his penchant and love for writing and launched his blog in 2007 as an armchair cultural critic. When social media sites such as Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram emerged, he operated under the well-known moniker, The Uppity, Negro. As he is well, still well known amongst social media networks and outlets, through his blog and other online social networks, Joshua engages conversations around modern day faith and religious and traditions, American contemporary religious life, as well as black religious thought, African American culture, politics in the age of Obama's presidency. Other writings by Joshua have been featured at religion disp dispatches and op-ed page pages of local newspapers. Early in his professional career, Joshua worked at Dillard University in the office of the university chaplain, providing spiritual leadership and discernment to undergraduate students. It was during his tenure at Dillard that he was able to partner with vocational work in ministry and his love for education. Joshua began to work positively, influencing the next class of young minds through leading the vocational leadership seminars, partnering across departments to bring mean meaningful and influential speakers to campus and serving as an adjunct professor in the Department of Religion and Philosophy. Joshua's research is focused on tracing the arc of black intellectualism in the 20th century to, pr to present and expectations for the future, while employing elements of critical race theory to discuss the intersectionality of race, gender, and politics through specific lenses of contemporary faith tradition using his formal training in theology. Currently, Joshua serves as the C. Eric Lincoln Minister for the Student Engagement at Duke University Chapel. His tenure has seen the expansion of undergraduate student programming around the visual arts and spiritual formation. This also includes serving as an off called upon campus-based facilitator for cultural competency, trainings and workshops in various departments and offices. He will continue his work of ministry and education as well as promoting religious and spiritual intellectualism. He is, he is using his background as a church musician and his experience as a collegiate choral singer to
to engage students in the field of theology and arts. He currently resides in Raleigh, North Carolina. Without further ado, after the Field Harmonic Society blesses us with the song entitled God Is, the next voice you show here is none other than Reverend Joshua Lazar.
for that. But last I checked, God is my all and all. If I didn't have an assignment this, don't go anywhere. Uh, if I didn't have an assignment this morning, um, we could stay right there. That felt good to me. I appreciate, I appreciate being able to come back home to an historically black college and that in the middle of the day on a Thursday, we can have flat out church. I appreciate that. I don't want to belabor the time much longer. Um, and also, I just want to say thank you for having me. It's an honor and a pleasure to be at the illustrious Clark Atlanta uh, University. I don't want to begin the process of calling names because inevitably, I will forget someone. I see a lot of familiar faces out there. Thank you for coming out. Um, but I do want to acknowledge uh, Lottie, Dottie, and everybody. That is my acknowledgement. Thank you for coming out this morning. If I may offer a word of prayer before I begin. To the God who is our all in all, God, we just want to say thank you for bringing us to this place to hear a word from you. God, if it is not on my manuscript, place it in my mouth. God, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be found pleasing and acceptable in your sight. For God, you are our strength and our most blessed redeemer. Holy Spirit, show up in this place and do your will. We offer up this prayer in your son Jesus' name. Amen. So, now we come to it. If you would take the following thought and hang it on the line and let the Holy Ghost blow on it, I want to talk about a mind is a terrible thing to waste on being black Christian and an intellectual. I recall the thought-provoking sermon of the Reverend Charles Gilchrist Adams that posed the homiletical conundrum of being drunk on the eve of Reconstruction. But today, I can't help but wonder, are we still inebriated, incapacitated, and absolutely wasted the day after Reconstruction has ended? I can't help but wonder, do we find ourselves stumbling into the new and unexpected reality of a new day hung over on the celebration of something that is no longer? Being inebriated, incapacitated, and I dare say wasted, as we face a new world and new terrors, much like the enslaved Africans who celebrated the Emancipation Proclamation in the late night hour as the year 1862 became 1863. Twelve years ago, black Americans celebrated what was heralded to be the hope that you can believe in. And then yet again, like after Reconstruction, the hope that we once had turned to unmitigated despair for so many. Now, I'm not here to have a policy debate. I don't want to be political. But it appears to me that nearly three years into this new age, something magnanimously has shifted. On this new day, in the era of Trump, and that's E-R-R-O-R, -R -R, I perceive that it's one thing to be drunk on the eve of Reconstruction but it's another thing to be inebriated, incapacitated, and wasted, hung over on the day after you're supposed to be living your best life. Inebriated in responses to the stored black institutions functioning in the 21st century, 
The slow and steady plotting decision-making process at black colleges and universities to effect change is the equivalent to a drunk person being asked to walk the line after getting pulled over for swerving. Incapacitated in so many black churches, passed out and immobilized when it comes to the responding to the shifting demographics. There are senior choirs still singing every praise six years after it was released and in an attempt to bring in the young folk. My sisters and my brothers, collectively I see wasted minds unable to catch a vision for the future, minds stewing in a toxic soup after imbibing what James Weldon Johnson saw as being drunk with the wine of the world. So what's the response for a community of people who thought they were living into the ethos of being shadowed beneath thy hand? May we forever stand true to our God and true to our native land, but find themselves back in the second verse, trotting down a stony road and encountering yet again a hope unborn that died. So what is it that is so attractive about these grapes that ferment and then are processed into wine that leaves one inebriated, incapacitated, and wasted? What is it then about the state of drunkenness that doesn't seem to be a temporary response, but rather a permanent state of being? a result of being resigned to coming back to the place where our fathers sighed, of coming back to the way that with tears has been watered. Now, I want to say this. This might be a little bit uh, unpopular, but honestly, I blame Barack Obama. The age of Obama left us drunk, feeling giddy off of the representation of a black man in the White House. Within hundreds of black churches, Barack Obama became enshrined in picture frames hanging on the wood paneling of pastors' offices or mounted in the hallways headed to church fellowship halls. I'll never forget listening to Jamal Bryant's Easter Sunday sermon in 2008 at Empowerment Temple where he preached the sermon entitled, Jeremiah Wright Wasn't Wrong, where he made the claim, we're headed to the White House and we're painting it red, black, and green. This moment was the finished work for the civic religiosity of black culture in America. You see, Obama had survived the crucible of the campaign and election night. He went into the grave of the gap between election and inauguration. And because, let's be clear, there were some who thought Obama would never make it to the dais and be sworn in, lest something happen. But on that cold January morning, he emerged from the tomb and was sworn in. Yeah. This was a finished work for so many a finished work of the African-American cultural struggle. And quiet as it's kept, some believe then, and maybe even some believe now, that Obama was and is the best we're ever going to get. Now, this is in part because blacks in this country, well, we've never always been able to, to win. The aftermath of his election left blacks tangibly accomplished in his win the death of the four little girls in a Birmingham church were justified. In his win, it made the death of the four black civil rights workers in Mississippi worth it. By his winning, it made the impassioned work of Fannie Lou Hamer validated. It made Harriet Tubman's trips back to the South multiple times verified. It somehow made the pain and suffering of slain civil rights widows, Coretta Scott King, Merle Evers, and Betty Shabazz, it made it somehow worth it. You see, Obama, at the time of his inauguration, he was the apotheosis of everything that black political and social action had been writing about, had been marching about, had been voting for, and even dying over from the moment enslaved Africans realized that they weren't free. Obama was the antithesis of that hope unborn that died, with campaign models as broad as change we can believe in, and simply the word hope. He was able to capture the thing that had been so elusive, not just for decades, but actual centuries. But now, over a decade later from the night of that historic win, hope that was born under Obama appears to be an infant child that died unexpectedly in the crib. You see, the death of hope births its diametrical opposition, a chilling and mind-numbing nihilism. This nihilism, this nothingness, it is the culmination of what inebriated dispositions, incapacitated understandings, intoxicated predictions, and wasted minds produce. So let me say no, in all fairness. I do not directly blame the first black president. 
However, the phenomenon that accounted for his ascendance, the American zeitgeist that he operated under as president, contributes to this nihilistic moment that we find ourselves in. And even now, having emerged from the time of what we thought was a reconstruction of those truths we hold and believe to be self-evident, where we began the process of making our spears, pruning hooks, and our swords into plowshares, into an era likened into what Henry Louis Gates called white redemption. In his most recent book, Stony the Road, uh, Gates recalls that the immediate period following Reconstruction between 1877 and forward until 1925 was an era of whiteness redeeming itself and reasserting its power in American culture. So, the question that gets resurrected for me is this. What happens when a community tells itself that its dreams have been actualized, that its desires have been granted, and its hopes have been fulfilled. My sisters and my brothers, this is a community that no longer needs prophets. If the job of prophets and truth tellers is to speak truth to power and speak a truth that empowers, what's the necessity of such an office if dreams have been actualized, desires have been granted, and hopes have been fulfilled? So it's in the sits in Lebanon that the times have found us. And I can't help but ponder what became of the black Christian intellectuals? This becomes a prescient question when within the last month, the pop icon, superstar, and entertainer who hails from the south side of Chicago, Kanye West, has challenged our notions of what it means to have church and to do church in this era of white redemption, in this era of Trump. With traditional notions of liturgy turned on its head, with conservative sensibilities of the sonic upset, when the old guard manner of requiring a brick and mortar building become agitated, what became of the black Christian intellectuals who possessed the alacrity to comment and offer context on the new phenomenon of Kanye West's Sunday service and throw it up and juxtapose it to him meeting with, grinning with, and taking pictures with, well, you should be able to figure out who I'm talking about. I'm sure there are other moments from the recent past that could be added if I had more time, but it speaks to the inebriated, incapacitated, and wasted minds of our culture that are behind the market forces that have led to the lack of black Christian intellectuals weighing in on these matters. By this I mean, as the nation attempts to navigate the contours of race, religion, and politics, there are not towering minds by which we are able to consistently turn to for the sake of constructive intellectual discourse. Now let me be clear, there are black Christians who perform intellectual labor in pulpits every single Sunday and in church classrooms every Wednesday for Bible study. There are those who engage in intellectual labor at religious nonprofits as well as black faculty at universities and colleges whose research is of the, most up, whose research is of the utmost to the field. However, in the classic sense of black public Christian intellectuals, the list is pitiably short. So what's the difference between someone, someone who's black, a Christian, and intelligent, and someone who is a black Christian intellectual? That is to suggest simply being smart doesn't make one an intellectual. As I see it, Having a deep love for the life of the mind and being guided by one's Christian faith are some of the prerequisites for embodying what it means to be a Christian intellectual. Now, before I continue about being black Christian and intellectual, allow me to get some parameters that have helped guide my journey here. I have three streams of consciousness informing the platform from which I want to share my thoughts today. First, let me say that black Christian intellectuals are at their best when they have both a philosophical and theological housing when observing the world. This isn't a preference of one over the other, but a complementary approach to being in the world. In a lecture, Princeton professor Eddie S. Glaude wrote that the good pragmatist then encourages a view of philosophy where neat conundrums of our professional practice give way to a certain kind of responsibility in our intellectual lives, where we take the tools of our training and work to offer insight, however limited, into specific conditions of value and into the specific consequences of ideas. 
Glaude is helpful in providing a useful philosophical lens by which we can better understand the beingness, the ontology of black Christian intellectuals, how we arrived here and where we're going. My second stream of consciousness is primarily informed by the late Dr. C. Eric Lincoln. Like many scholars and thinkers of his time, he noted that religion anticipates change just as the conversion is itself change. Change for what is better. He goes on to write specifically that black religion begins with the unshakable faith that all things are possible with God. Howard Thurman put it another way, writing that a religious experience is interpreted to mean the conscious and direct exposure of the individual to God. So when I speak of religion, it is animated by these concepts and ideologies. I draw from, these, I draw from the wells of these two because to read such an understanding of religion or the word religious, it, it expands for me, or at least it appropriately problematizes the millennial sensibilities of the word. For many my age and younger, those words of religion get replaced with spirituality. So Dr. Lincoln's words now would then read, spirituality anticipates change. And black spirituality begins with the unshakable faith that all things are possible with God. And what Thurman describes isn't so much a religious experience, it's a spiritual one. So this generational substitution is how we get the pithy phrase, I'm spiritual but not religious. Because somehow religion became associated with the formal structures of a denominational polity, the inner workings of a church's generational struggles. And then spirituality became this incorporeal thing that was only embodied in the utterances of unknown tongues, praise breaks, and worship moments. Yet, I think Lincoln and Thurman are calling to us from the ancestral plane, reminding us that the whole set of it, the denominational polity and the glossolalia, the generational struggles and the praise breaks are all needed to encompass what we know as religion. Specifically in this case, that which is a black religious experience. And now we come to the third one. The third stream of consciousness that is influencing my talk today is that in a true sense, I don't think people care for the church. I don't think that. This apathy, this lack of caring is crystallized in Cornell West's tour de force race matters where he remarks that it isn't the structural problems of society nor the lack of the Protestant work ethic that most threatens black Americans but rather a deep-seated nihilism that pervades the lives of so many. West defines nihilism as the lived experience of coping with a life of horrifying meaninglessness, hopelessness, and most important, lovelessness. To put a fine point on it, I don't think, now people might disagree with me, but I don't think, writ large, people actually care about the institution of the black church, period, point blank, without any qualifications. Now, I don't say this lightly, and I don't say this with the intent of attempting to harken back to the old time way, nor is this some subversive conservative argument steeped in a holiness mindset from which I speak. Because on the surface, it appears as, there, as though there are people who are fully engaged and care about these things. But I'd counter that argument by pointing to what we see happening on social media. And what we see on social media is nothing more than what's called virtue signaling. David Sharia Madari of The Guardian writes that virtue signaling, excuse me, virtue signaling is a smug posturing from a position of self-appointed authority. Let me read that one more time. Virtue signaling is a smug posturing from a position of self-appointed authority. Therefore, I submit that many care more about what others perceive them to think on an issue than actually caring about the issue itself. So thus, Glaude, Lincoln, Thurman, and West aid me in concluding that there is what I call a pragmatic religious nihilism affecting both the attitudes toward and the attitudes within African-American religious culture. That is to say, in a deep practical sense, that many of us no longer believe that African-American religious culture, and in this case, African-American Christian religious culture in its current form has the capacity, as Dr. Lincoln wrote, to anticipate change, particularly change for what is better. Now, I'm sure some of you all are forming your counter argument in your head by simply saying, look, there are millions of black people that show up to churches week after week. Let me be clear, 
I'm not so much offering the observation of the pew members, but I do believe that amongst church leadership, amongst pastors, deacons, trustees, ministers, directors of music, or whatever we're calling them these days, uh, ministers of worship, worship in the arts, whatever we, we're calling ourselves today, uh, or even lay leaders, for so many of us that when we look out at empty churches, the nihilism creeps in. I remember sitting in a church meeting once and there was a presentation about millennials and how we enter church spaces. And it was attended mostly by people over the age of 50. The church didn't have a significant young adult population. And in the midst of the back and forth, one of the elders in the room, she was over 65, she wistfully said, and I'm paraphrasing here, that the pastor should just continue to preach the gospel and let God do the rest. Now in this case, this elderly black woman opted for the virtue signaling Pollyanna version of her church rather than the nihilism. Because a simple rebuttal, and anybody who knows me, it took a lot for me not to turn to her and say, so what has the pastor been doing for the last 30 years, not preaching the gospel? For her, I'm sure she knew what would happen if she didn't cling on to that alternative reality. Unfortunately, for so many pragmatic, excuse me, unfortunately for so many, pragmatic religious nihilism is the guiding force that supports the virtue signaling on social media. And it supports the general unhappiness that so many people have when they show up to church on Sunday. For me, pragmatic religious nihilism is an outgrowth of a wasted mind. We only get to a pragmatic religious nihilism when it is perceived that the apex of ex when, the, when it is perceived that the apex of existence has already been reached. African American religious culture can only encounter this paradox when it seems as though dreams have been actualized, desires have been granted, and hope has been fulfilled. However, isn't it unfortunate that as a black religious community that we are attempting to navigate a new reality in a world that we did not create. And in an attempt to combat the soul crushing pressures of pragmatic religious nihilism, so many opt for the satiating sedatives of the world, electing to be inebriated and incapacitated with a wasted mind. I declare that there are black minds out there right now that are shirking their duty, rebuffing their democratic responsibility and capitulating to culture by not embracing the ideals and the actual calling of what it means to be a black Christian intellectual. As there are those who are comfortable with being inebriated and incapacitated in the face of monumental cultural shifts in the Brobdingnagian political machinations, I can't help but wonder what constitutes a wasted mind. Colloquially, one may say that someone who is drunk is wasted out of their mind. But if a mind is truly a terrible thing to waste, what comprises a wasted mind? First, a wasted mind embraces the empire. And in this case, the American Christian empire is dominated by what we know as white evangelicalism. And I want to be clear, the nomenclature of white evangelicals or white evangelicalism is less a spiritual designation or religious orientation than it is a political one. For I'd allege that white evangelicalism is in fact a heretical movement that is opposed to the beliefs, the philosophies, the teachings, the soteriology, the pneumatology, and eschatology of a brown-skinned first-century Palestinian Jew who was born in Bethlehem, hung on a cross in the city of David, and who was resurrected out of Joseph's borrowed tomb. For me, white evangelicalism isn't Christianity, and white evangelicals aren't practicing Christianity. Rather, I see their true commitments as a devotion to what I call messianic white supremacy. A large cult that believes Jesus to be on the side of those who believe themselves to be white, it supports capitalism without criticism and American exceptionalism without evaluation. The authentic anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and anti-black sentiments in this country are rooted in capitalist and Protestant ideals promoted by political hacks and their priests who occupy pulpits Sunday after Sunday. And there are wasted black minds that devote themselves to these ideals because of expedience, 
because of convenience, because of respectability politics, and because it's the easiest thing to do. They do it out of laziness and because it's the path of least resistance. The habituation of Eurocentric modes of worship that say it don't take all that. The consistent use of hymns that still privilege whiteness over things that are black. It's 2019 and black churches are still asking Jesus to wash our black souls white as snow. Wasted black minds still maintain the unyielding devotion of singularly seeing Jesus as lowly, meek, and mild, and ignoring the fact that the empire, both a Roman one and an American one, ain't never executed someone for being lowly, meek, and mild. Give me one second. I'm going to get there eventually. Those who earned execution by the state, who spoke truth to power, and directly challenged the status quo. And remember what I said. Wasted minds embrace the empire. Embrace to hold someone closely in your arms, especially as a sign of affection. A wasted mind hugs the empire. A wasted mind will hug the convicted murderer after a racially charged crime because I'm struggling right up and through here. I don't recall the judge hugging any of the Central Park Five after their wrongful <laughs> conviction. Trust and believe the lowly, the meek, and the mild were the ones the empire appreciated, the ones with wasted minds. Langston Hughes put it this way, Negroes, sweet and docile, meek and humble and kind, beware the day they change their mind. Secondly, a wasted mind lacks prophetic imagination. Prophetic imagination is when you catch a glimpse of the future. Paul reminds us that we see through a glass dimly. We see and know in part, and therefore we prophesy in part. But maybe, just maybe, prophetic imagination is what the hymn writer sums up as a foretaste of glory divine. The ability to see a good and a righteous future. But wasted minds rely on antiquated information to bring forth impotent prophecies. And let me be clear, possessing a prophetic imagination is part of the African retentions that survived the Middle Passage. It's what Margaret Washington refers to as intuitive religious insights in reference to Sojourner Truth. Truth, who was not a literate woman, embodied what Karen Baker Fletcher called a visionary literacy that comprised of African oralities, ontologies, and memories that allow her a communicating knowledge as an alternative discourse. This organic practice of prophetic imagination, some of us might know it as having sanctified imagination, helps broaden and widen notions of just what it means to be a black Christian intellectual over the years. It's the ability to see something that is not there and cast a future prosperity for the community and not just for the individual. And as I sit and watch far too many of our precious historically black colleges limp from year to year, struggling, I say to myself, we didn't get here overnight. The lack of prophetic imagination doesn't just kill our HBCUs, it kills our churches as well. I was reading a story in the Washington Post last year of a historically black church in Washington, D.C. in its 149th year that voted to disband the congregation. And a church that seats 1,000 and built in the 1920s, only 24 members were showing up every week. There was even a point in time in which they went eight years without a senior pastor. The news story said that the church was closing due to gentrification in the neighborhood. The reporter interviewed a member who said that many parishioners had moved out of the area and the coffee shops had moved in. And that even bike racks were established in places where people used to park. The narrative was that gentrification, that the narrative was that gentrification is what killed the church. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. The death cycle of a church can be stretched out as much as 30 years. Somewhere 30 years ago, key decisions were made, and more importantly, key decisions were not made by church leadership and members that are long gone. Shame on the wasted minds that weren't open to the spirit and failed to embrace a radical prophetic imagination. 
So wasted minds embrace the empire. Wasted minds lack prophetic imagination. And finally, wasted minds have no hope. The long litany of structural problems facing those who are black and brown in this world have laid waste to the hopes and dreams of millions. That is to say, I can understand a wasted mind that has no hope. That one makes sense to me in a way that if one chooses to embrace empire and chooses not to have a prophetic imagination, those are choices of the individual. But far too often in these yet to be United States, there are outside forces there are powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places that can drive you to a place of no hope if you don't watch out. They can drive you to a place where you begin to question your sanity and unfairly question your God. The bedrock of black and Christian intellectuals as I see it is to always turn to hope in the face of nihilism. To possess a resurrection power of transmogrifying a hope that unborn had died into a song of hope that the present has brought us. To be the human catalyst that faces toward the rising sun of a new day begun, ever marching onward toward victory. Black Christian intellectuals historically set their sights against the prosperity gospel that the mid 20th century American culture produced. And I need not litigate the volumes of books, texts, speeches, and sermons that stood against prosperity gospel's allegiance to the norms of Western civilization and capitalism. However, it appears that we have entered a new era precipitated by this pragmatic religious nihilism. The preachers of prosperity gospel are no longer the religious boogeymen that they once were. So again, what's the role of a prophet when dreams have been actualized, desires have been granted, and hopes have been fulfilled? What's the role of a black Christian intellectual when the efforts of the historic propagators of prosperity gospel have in effect been neutralized? In the absence of a forceful cohort of black Christian intellectuals and with the public and constant criticism of prosperity gospel having greatly subsided, what I call an unmindful gospel has been allowed to run rampant and unchecked. An unmindful gospel is a message that relies on the lowest common denominator of social sensibilities to spread its message. It's evident in the crafting of a sermon, not for the sake of memory and communal transformation, but for the sake of social media, social media virility. It's the curating of a pastor's Instagram feed that only shows the happy moments with friends and family. It's the church meme culture where notions of the sacred have been obliterated. This unmindful gospel, I dare say, cares nothing about the future. It only cares about the present. The latest two minute clip posted to Instagram is only as memorable as its length watched, hence the desire for virility. And I see virility as nothing more than a momentary achievement of popularity in an oversaturated market. The unmindful gospel, it's fleeting, it's ephemeral, it's short-lived, it's temporal, it's transitory, it's forgetful, it's fugitive, it's spasmodic, it's volatile, it's slow, it's dim-witted, it's obtuse. In fact, it's anti-intellectual. This type of otherness bargaining that black religious culture opted for and the Faustian exchange of a relatively vibrant black Christian intellectual culture that had a future casting component to it one that was turned against the empire and one that embraced prophetic imagination. Instead, we've settled for wasted minds acting as anti-Christological idols who focus on the short term, on the ephemeral, on the temporal, and on the transitory. And y'all, if that's the exchange we've made, we may have gotten the short end of the stick. I'm suggesting that in a cultural atmosphere that's more interested in spilling the tea and exposing church leaders for what they do in the privacy of their own bedroom in a church culture that's reduced homiletics to the use of props and demonstrations about relationships and musicians, and I say this as a musician myself, who are more interested in making sure their smartphones are at the right angle to get their faces or their fingers when they're playing the latest groove. Where's the space for being black, a Christian, and an intellectual? Culture, especially church culture, and very particularly black church culture, has shifted so much and so fast over the past decade or so 
that it appears that there was no room left for those that critically think about the ways of the world and the people in it. That we as a black religious Christian culture exchange the ability to hope for the future for Facebook status likes, shares, Twitter retweets, upvotes on YouTube videos, and live video numbers. The fact that no one cares, remember I said that, the fact that no one cares about what is lost in such an exchange and that the visions for the future are so nearsighted is exactly why pr pragmatic religious nihilism is so dangerous. So, how is it that those under the sound of my voice and feel so moved to answer the call to fulfilling what it means to be a black Christian intellectual actually activate their faith and move on the prophetic word. I'm glad you asked. So if you journey with me back through the corridors of time and through the historic landscape and stop by the house of Gaius in Corinth and peer over the shoulder of Tertius transcribing the words of Paul, I can see Tertius's pen scrawling on the parchment. Kai me siskematezefi. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and what is perfect and what is acceptable. I know many of us are for more, more familiar with, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. I submit to you that one of the building blocks by which Christian, black Christian intellectuals should operate is by engaging in the practice of always and constantly renewing their minds. The best anecdote to an unmindful gospel is the creating of spaces and places for mindful Christian practices. So if I can park here for a moment and hang out here homiletically, it irks my spirit when I hear pastors from the pulpit eschew solid intellectual thoughts for the sake of a literal interpretation of a biblical text just to claim a moral absolution that probably does more harm than it does good. And unfortunately, this is not just relegated to our pulpits. Disappointingly, we're at a point where if one is searching for black Christian intellectual practices, the black church usually isn't the place for it. While yes, there are individual black churches that espouse intellectual informed theologies from the pulpit and or create an atmosphere for intellectually religious conversations in midweek classes, this is not the norm. If the only book that's read in the church, aside from the Bible, is a part of the pastor's product line, then perhaps that's a church without a friendly intellectual atmosphere. Paul is conducive to me making my point here. Be transformed. Because what I'm talking about is having a made-up mind. One that intentionally cares about the Christian welfare and well-being of its people. This, intentional, this intentionality cares about the Christian welfare and well-being of its people. The intentional care for people beats back the crushing waves of a pragmatic religious nihilism and an unmindful gospel message back to the sea of forgetfulness where it belongs. Cornel West helps us out by saying that the tasks of Christian intellectuals are to uphold the centrality of prophetic preaching of the word, preserve the richness of the Christian past, and put forward informed Christian ways of life and struggle. I would add that there ought to be a very intentional commitment to the life of the mind, and I dare suggest that both of these things can exist at the same time. So, if I could broaden this out just a little bit more, what I'm talking about isn't just something that needs to take place in the insular walls of our churches. What's seriously needed is a revaluation, indeed a revolution, of our public marketplaces where ideas are exchanged. Social media reminds me that we've forgotten how to have discourse in public. Gone are the days when Tavis Smiley would host the State of the Black Union and focus on the black church. Instead, public discourse on black religious life is done by unmindful clergy on social media or by those that are ignorant of cultural streams that make us who we are. Admittedly, it's an uphill battle to dialogue about these weightier matters when The Breakfast Club with Charlemagne the God and Angela Yee are the primary example of what black public discourse looks like. 
So it's somewhere, I believe, around about the 17th chapter of the book of Acts. We see Paul actually practicing what he preaches. Paul escapes Thessalonica and finds himself in Athens, the seat of the Roman Empire, waiting for the word from Silas and Timothy. In verse 17, it reads that Paul reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace. marketplace. I think that's a practice that we've forgotten, what it actually means to sit and talk to someone in dialogue. Not just a debate where you win points for zingers, one-liners, and shutdowns worthy of a cable news show. The value of a viral clip is dependent on how well one person shuts down the other. But it's clear in this text that Paul didn't have a shutdown prepared for the Epicureans and the Stokes that wanted to talk to him. Even though they questioned and pondered these strange things as they heard Paul, as they heard Paul and accused him of babbling. Nonetheless, they invited Paul to the Areopagus to share what he had to say. And in public, Paul became what I see as the first Christian intellectual. So thus, I believe we need more Mars Hill-like spaces, not just amongst our own Christian communities, but in places that are actually public. As Christians, especially as black Christians, we ought not be ashamed of intellect. Intellectualism is not the enemy of spirituality. If Paul could reason at the synagogue, then that means we ought to be able to speak intellectually in our churches. Every church should start an Areopagus or Mars Hill Club, a space where church members learn the art of intelligently speaking about their faith, as well as a place to learn more and inform others about the social world we are all living in, leaning into the practice of being transformed by the renewing of their minds so that they may discern the will of the Lord. So that dying, maybe already dead adult Sunday school class needs to be transformed into a Mars Hill Club. That midweek prayer service or Bible study that the faithful few show up for needs to be transformed into an Areopagus. We can't keep doing the same old things and expecting different results. But finally, as I'm in good black preacher tradition, as I'm about to go to my seat, to reclaim and fulfill the future destiny of black Christian intellectualism, one rooted in hope, not in despair, an expectation, not pessimism, rooted in the future promises, not the myopic present nor an ahistorical past. The ketuvium of the ancient Jewish community helps me out as the scribes of ancient wrote the words that still ring true for us daily. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I attended the Hampton University Ministers Conference two summers ago, and I heard the words of Dr. Wayne Croft, who very succinctly said, now catch this, hope works against the data. Hope works against the data. The data of the survivors of Jerusalem in this Lamentations text says that God has abandoned them. The data says that God died when the temple was destroyed. The data says that God stopped listening to their prayers when the troops came in and burned the city. The data says that God had abandoned the survivors of Jerusalem. They survived only in exile and had to face an uncertain future. The data says that black men are the least likely racial and gender group to survive a stop by the police. The data says that black women are the most likely racial and gender category to su suffer from the pay gap in the United States. The data shows that blacks are unemployed at a higher rate than any other racial group. The data shows that blacks are disproportionately affected by a lack of health care options. The data shows that we live in a country that has policies that turn away immigrants and see fit to criminalize young children at the border by housing them in cages. But nevertheless, hope works against the data. I love the clause of this first verse, but this I call to my mind and therefore I have hope. That is the crux of what it means to be a black Christian intellectual, to maintain hope. A hope that shuns the empire. A hope that embraces prophetic imagination. Now this isn't just 
an eschatological hope wrapped up in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it's an existential hope that believes on earth as it is in heaven and believes that the words of John in Revelation where he saw a new heaven come down to earth. So what then is this hope? This hope is a steadfast love of God that never ceases. This hope is that God's mercies never end. The songwriter put it this way, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. This hope is a hope that reminds any survivor that if God saw fit to wake you up this morning, clothed in your right mind and not a wasted mind, that this hope isn't about the sweet by and by, but it's a hope that is situated for the nasty now and now. All I have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. We have a Christian hope, a hope that says they will beat their swords into plowshares and, and their spears into pruning hooks and will study war no more. A hope that says every valley shall be exalted and every mountain be made low, the crooked places made straight up, and the rough places made plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. A hope that says, I will restore unto you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar, and it shall come to pass, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. A hope that says your sons and your daughters will prophesy. The old will dream dreams and the young shall see visions. A hope that says justice will roll down like rivers of water and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. We have a hope that says no weapon that is formed against me shall be able to prosper. A hope that says the Lord is my light and my salvation, of whom shall I fear? A hope that says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Uh, a hope that says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Uh, we have a Christian hope, uh, a hope that says that the gospel will be preached to the poor, the brokenhearted will be healed, uh, the captives will be delivered, uh, and the blind will see, uh, and liberty will be given to those that are bruised. Uh, we have a hope uh, that says this is the acceptable year of the Lord. We have a hope that we shall overcome. We have a hope that it came to pass and it did not come to stay. We have a hope that trouble don't last always. We have a hope that if God be for us, then who can be against us? We have a hope that neither height nor depth, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Uh, one Friday in the city of David, uh, hope walked up Golgotha's hill. Uh, hope was hung high and stretched wide. Uh, hope hung its head for me and he died. Uh, hope died, y'all. Uh, hope stayed dead all night Friday. Uh, hope stayed dead all night Saturday. But early on Sunday morning, hope got up with resurrection power. My hope is secure. My hope is sound. My hope is everlasting. My hope endures all things. My hope shall never die. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ. The solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Thank you and God bless. Come on, let's rise for the singing of our Clark Atlanta alma mater, written by none other than Dr. C. Eric Lincoln. Thank you for your patience. That's the Reverend Joshua Lawrence Lazar mind is a terrible thing to waste on being black, Christian, and intellectual. Thank you so much for your presence, for your presence. We're going to ask our faculty, our guests, our students to take photographs immediately following our benediction.
and then we will have lunch in the Thomas Cole Boardroom. There's also a part two at evening a session. I'm going to ask Dr. Powell if he'll come and tell you real quickly about the six o'clock uh, evening session. Is he here? For my music department. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, there's a church music seminar, church music forum taking place this evening at 6 p.m. in the Absalom Jones Episcopal Center, which is next door to the alumni house. Uh, Reverend Lazard and Dr. Wise are the moderators for that forum. So if you're available, interested, please join us 6 o'clock this evening. Thank you. I am a model, Rain Clark, Atlanta. We lost power.
Amen. Thank you so much. With the Lincoln family, let's bring mom up, family members, special guests come up for the photographs, all of our students, our alums, will you come? God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Powell, and our wonderful choir.